Yeah, there's still more. Today we're talking about receivables and what you can do to use them to raise money to buy a business as well. I'm David C. Barnett, and you're tuned in to Small Business and Deal Making, the podcast, YouTube channel, and blog where I talk about buying, selling, financing, and managing small and medium sized businesses while controlling risk. So if you're looking to take control of your future through buying a business one day, or if you already own a business and you're looking to grow or exit, you've come to the right place. I talk about interesting things, I talk to interesting people, and I answer your questions every week right here. So be sure to hit like and be sure to hit subscribe, and let's get to it. All right, uh, again, this is part of a summer series I'm doing on alternative financing or how to raise money to buy a business without using a bank. And uh, we've created a playlist. So if you if you look up above, there should be a link to it. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can watch back from the beginning. And in the beginning, I talk about seller financing, down payments, deferred down payments. And again, this is going to be applicable to today's conversation. Last week, we talked about inventory and how you can use inventory to look at different ways to raise a down payment or, or a deferred down payment for someone. Today, we're going to talk about receivables. Now, when you buy a business... If it's an asset purchase or if it's a share purchase, you will get receivables as part of the operating capital that transfers over if you negotiate the deal that way. Sometimes people negotiate and they do not include these operating capital assets. So they might buy the business and the seller will continue to, to collect their own receivables. And in that way, you won't get that operating capital when you take over the business. So if you're going to buy a business and you have a certain amount of money for a down payment and you're not getting the operating capital, then that means you have to set aside part of your own money or have a credit facility lined up to provide that operating capital until the invoices you issue to customers are going to start to come back through payments to you. So if we can figure out a way to not have to come up with that operating capital, it means more of our cash at hand can be applied to the down payment. So this is a way that we can we can get a bigger amount of down payment by not having to set aside money for operating capital. So what what is this tool? It's called factoring. And I actually created a video about it many years ago called Factoring Receivables how it works. We'll put a link to it here. Uh, basically when you factor a receivable, it means that a customer owes you money and you then go to a factoring company and they buy the receivable from you. And how does it work? Well, accepting credit cards is actually sort of a kind of factoring because instead of the customer owing you the money, they owe the money to their credit card and the credit card company gives you the amount of money that they owe less a finance cost, a discount fee. So in the case of a, a $100 meal at a restaurant, if you pay that on your credit card, the restaurateur might get $98 you get till the end of the month or whatever to pay your credit card. So in a certain way, the restaurateur is accepting less money today in order to not have to be the person that waits 30 days to get the money, okay? In a similar vein, that's how factoring works. And so what's different about it is that um, you create the invoice for the customer after you've done the product or service, and the factor then buys the invoice from you. And instead of giving you 98% of the money or whatever up front, they usually give you an advance. It might be 75 to 80% of the face value of that receivable. You send the bill to the customer, but it's been indicated on the bill that the customer is supposed to pay, not you, but the factor. Okay. So you send an invoice to somebody, they pay the factoring company because the factoring company is going to further reduce the amount they give you based on how long it takes for that invoice to be to be paid. So in one example, there might be a 3% fee for every month that they wait. So you issue an invoice for $100, they give you 75 or 80 today. And then when the customer pays them, they then, if they give you an $80 advance, they'll then give you another $17 so you end up with $97, which is 100 less their $3 fee. Now, what, why would you do that? Well, it means that you can turn that invoice into cash today to pay your bills. So you don't need to be the one financing those receivables. The factoring company does. The idea being that now you can run the business without having the operating capital. So what's the problem? 
if um, you know the credit card companies cost two or three percent and the factoring company costs two or three percent, isn't that the same? No, not really, because you're not getting the full amount of money less the discount fee like you do from the credit card company. You're only getting an advance. You're waiting for the balance. So if you actually look at the amount of money you were advanced and then you look at the fee you ultimately pay, you'll see that it's a much higher cost of financing than if you were to look at the credit card company's discount fee as a cost of financing. And it's cheaper to accept the credit cards in general. The other thing too, is that this is not available in every line of, of industry. Some businesses have a hard time uh, getting factoring. It depends on the status of their invoices and what industry they're in. So for example, in construction, not many factoring companies want to buy the, re the receivables of a factor of a construction company because those um, invoices are subject to offsets if there's some deficiency in the construction work, right? And the factoring company wants to know that the full amount is due and payable when they invest in buying that receivable. And so it can create a few difficulties or hiccups. There's some industries that this is happening very often in. So there's a lot of factoring in the trucking industry and in the textiles industry. I think it actually was created in the textiles and clothing manufacturing industry because of the long times involved between when a department store used to order, for example, winter clothes might be ordered in the spring. And then the, the companies making the clothes had to buy their materials and pay for the material. And maybe they weren't going to get paid for the winter coats until after they were sold you know, sometime in January or February, created these huge lengths of time that had to be financed. And so these other people stepped in to buy these receivables. Now, why would somebody buy an invoice or a receivable due from, you know, JCPenney? Well, JCPenney should be good for it, right? Or any of these big companies. I, again, we're going back in time to the beginning of factoring in the, in the clothing or garment industry. So it's not the company at hand that is analyzed for its credit, credit worthiness. It's the company you're selling to. So if you're selling to big, solid companies that have good reputations, cash flow, credit histories, et cetera, the factoring company is going to be more willing to be able to, to finance that invoice for you. Now, if you're more of a cash business, like you accept cash and credit cards at the till, there's another version of this called merchant cash advance where companies will advance you money based on the average transactions happening at the credit card terminal. And you could take, for example, 10, 20, $30,000. And what they'll do is they'll take a percentage of the amount of money that runs through that terminal every day. And they'll, they'll railroad that away to themselves in order to recoup back the investment. I've created another video, which if you're ever going to look at this, you should really pay close attention to this video. It's called How Expensive is Merchant Cash Advance? And we'll put a link to it up here. Because this type of financing can be really horrendously expensive. I often uh, will liken this to the payday loans of the small business world, just because of the ultimate cost and how much it costs on a percentage or imputed interest basis um, to the people that use it. Here's you know, sort of the, the upside to this stuff is if you can make this work, then you can put more of your own money towards the down payment. It can help you buy a business. Number two, you will almost always reduce the profitability of the business. Like I talked about last week with the inventory and trade financing. So it really only works well if you have a high gross margin in your product or service. And here's the other problem. I've actually had people, and as you know, I've got videos out there questioning the sanity of trying to buy a business with no money. But I've had people respond to some of those videos by saying, well, this deal took place and we did this and we factored the receivables and we did a merchant cash advance and, and we basically pasted together all these little financing methods to get the money and the guy bought the business. If you're committing a percentage of your receipts to a merchant cash advance supplier, and you are going to earn less money on every job you do because you're using factoring, for example, then those costs come out, not out of the gross margin, but out of the net. Because you're adding a new overhead expense that is going to be charged on every dollar coming through your company. So it comes out of the bottom line. And I've seen people give me examples online of this is what we did and literally have described 
them surrendering the entire average net margin of that industry to these finance companies. Meaning that if they're in an industry where the average net margin is like seven or 8% of the top line, they've committed that entire seven or 8% to finance companies. So what's left for the person buying, right? Nothing. Again, so should this kind of strategy be undertaken by someone trying to buy a business to replace their income and they're going to go over and run that business? Well, if you're committing what can end up being big chunks of the net income at the bottom towards these finance companies, then you can end up being in a position where you don't actually have the cash flow to pay yourself. And so again, it can probably most wisely be used if you're already in business in that industry and you're doing a strategic acquisition or you're buying a business that you know doesn't require your presence full time and you're going to keep your, your income or you have a spouse that can support you. Some way for you not to have to rely upon the cash flow of that business to support yourself. Those are probably the people who are best able to do these strategies. Again, not broke people trying to buy a business with no money. So anyway. If you have experience with merchant cash advance or factoring, I'd love to hear about it. And so do the other viewers. People go down in the comments and they look at what people share and they comment on the comments. A lot of my videos have really great conversations and I'd love to hear what your experience has been, both good and bad, of how these kinds of strategies have been employed by you in your business as an operating means or through trying to do an acquisition. Because again, I see people talking about these strategies online as though it were a commonplace, everyday, easy thing to do, but it isn't. It depends on the industry, depends on your gross margin, on the net margin. It depends on how quickly customers pay. There are a lot of variables involved in figuring out if this kind of thing is even viable for the business that you're looking at buying. And if you're going to be putting together something like that, I would highly, highly, highly recommend that you head over to bizplanschool.com and do my cash flow forecasting and business plan writing program. Because if you're going to significantly change the cost structure of a business, like with these types of financing tools, you need to make sure that the business is still going to perform and be able to service all these debts. One of the great things about not getting a bank loan to buy a business is that you don't have to deal with the banker. One of the bad things about not going to a bank to buy a business is that the banker can't help you save you from doing something dumb. Because a lot of the times when bankers decline loans, it's because they see that there's no way you can afford it. They see that the deal doesn't work. And so <clears throat> in a certain respect, a good banker helps protect you from yourself in doing something dumb. And if the banker is not going to be involved, if you're doing a deal entirely outside of, of the bank, then you got to make sure that you protect yourself. Because I'll tell you, these merchant cash advance people, all they look at is what amount of money is going through the terminal every day. And they'll advance you money based on that. And they'll just let you juggle all the problems. Anyway, I'm sure I'll get some, some loving comments down below based on that. I love you guys. I, I want the best for you. That's why I'm warning you about some of these things. Anyway, hope you're enjoying the series and we'll see you next time. So how can you learn more about buying, selling, financing, and managing small and medium-sized businesses? Easy. Head over to my blog site, davidcbarnett.com, where you can learn more about me and how I work with my clients. You can learn more about my books and the online courses that I've prepared for you. You can find out about how to subscribe to my email list, the YouTube playlists, etc. There's literally hundreds of hours of content there, all for free, and I'd love for you to be my guest. Special thanks go out to Jeff Alpaw Customs for being my tailor. Men all around the world can look dangerous, just like me, with the help of Jeff Alpaw Customs. JeffAlpaw.com. Use the code DCB10 to save. They handle multiple currencies and ship anywhere you happen to be.